Um, so just without further ado, I'm going to um, I want to say a couple things I know about you, Bob, that I find interesting that uh, uh, about your kind of, you know, growing up in Chicago in the Midwest and coming to Duke in the early 70s. Um, also being a basketball player and loving sports <laughs> and uh, and then making your way to Duke, uh, which uh, we're grateful for um, that you came to Duke. And that's kind of where the first question of our you know, student cohort begins um, is kind of like your start at Duke and how you got into cinematography. Um, so uh, why I want everybody to introduce themselves, I'm gonna just jump in to this conversation. And at, when you ask your question, you can say, you know, introduce yourself that way. If that works, cool. Uh, okay, y'all, so let's start, uh, let's see. Let's start with, Anna's question. I'm just going down the list, and Bob has seen this. There are no surprise questions. Yep. <laughs> so take it, take it away, Anna, with your question. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here and for making time to talk to us. Um, my question is about your Duke experience, and um, if you could maybe talk about if it uh, shaped your professional interests and aspirations, uh, and if so, how uh, how do you use what you learned at Duke in your work? Okay. Uh, well, as Amy said, I was at Duke uh, a long, long time ago before any of you were even born. <laughs> and it was a different school then. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly evolved quite a bit since I, I went to Duke. But when I was at Duke, uh, most of the kids, uh, students were, uh, you know, went on to become doctors and lawyers and people in the professions. And there was no film program. There was no film classes. And, uh, you know, I came to Duke and, and to be honest, uh, my first semester there, I was uh, uh, pre-med. I thought I wanted to be a doctor, but after spending uh, my first semester in a lot of labs, I realized that wasn't for me. And I kind of drifted along, you know, I wasn't really sure, you know, and I took all kinds of different classes and uh, just still a little lost in what my career path would be. and and. Uh, I got involved, I'd always loved movies growing up in Chicago, and um, I got involved with Free Water Films, which uh, at that time would show, uh, you know, foreign films on the weekends. And uh, I was, uh, you know, I'd always watched American studio movies, but I hadn't really been uh, aware of a lot of the foreign films, and it kind of exposed me to those films. And, you know, it opened my eyes a lot to cinematic possibilities. And I remember, uh, I still didn't really consider a career because, uh, you know, making movies was something they did in Hollywood in New York. It was not something they did in Chicago or certainly not in Durham. And, uh, but one weekend I went over to Raleigh and I watched the movie Clockwork Born, just Stanley Kubrick movie. And I was just so kind of blown away by the film that I, uh, as I drove back to Durham, I was like, I really want to get involved in this. And uh, again, at, at that time, there wasn't a lot of, there were zero film classes, but, uh, and it, I didn't know anybody in the film industry. I was from the Midwest. And so I decided to go to grad school. I went to USC grad school and you know, that's where I kind of honed my, my interest. But to answer your question about Duke, I, I, I valued very much my education because I, I really uh, uh, appreciated the, the quality of the education I was getting there, even if it wasn't film related. And um, if you go on to work in the film industry, you know, most of the directors I work with are very smart, educated people. And you have to be able to relate to them on that level, you know, and, and I think that that's one thing that Duke gave me was just a very broad based education that I greatly appreciated. And certainly I have to credit Freewater Films with uh, introducing me to a lot of these films that I was unaware of. So. Uh, in today's world, of course, you have a film program there and it's becoming very good. And, and uh, I've been following over the years. I know Josh Gibson. I know a lot of the people involved and, and they seem like really good people. And I think there's a lot more opportunities today at Duke uh, than there were when I was there as far as filmmaking goes. So I hope I answered your question. 
Thanks for doing this. This is a uh, really cool. It's not every day you get to, you know, talk to a Hollywood cinematographer. <laughs> um, my question is like, yeah, you're really, really like well known in the field, but everyone has to start somewhere. And I know you said you didn't take any film classes at Duke. So I was just wondering what kind of film experience did you have when you were an undergraduate and how did you start expanding on your experiences during college? Well, I was always a still photographer and, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, back then everything was film and and so I took a lot of stills and uh, but I think with the to contrast it with today with the digital revolution I mean it, it, you know if you wanted to shoot film motion pictures it was a very expensive proposition you had to rent a camera you had to uh, buy film you had to pay lab fees there you know it costs a lot of money and most students can't afford to do something like that so um, with today's digital cameras though, you know, relative, I mean, we own a, a Canon cameras, we own Blackmagic cameras at, at my house. And you, once you buy, uh, you know, a million others, I'm not hawking those brands at all, but you can go out and shoot digitally and you can even edit on your computer as you probably all know. And so I think what it's done is it's allowed people to young people to experiment more and go out and make your own films. My daughter's a student, she's a senior at Wesleyan, and uh, she shoots a lot of films with her friends. And uh, I think there's more opportunities today than there were back then. It was a tougher time to break in. I mean, that said, with COVID, uh, it's a tough time to be a college senior right now because you know the opportunities are very limited because of COVID and, and it's kind of knocked a lot of people out of the game. But I, I hope that's only a temporary thing because as time goes on, you know, uh, we're trying to welcome more young people into the film industry, but it's, it's a tough, tough road. And, and even back when I got out of school, it took me a long time to kind of get a foothold in the business, particularly if you don't know anybody. So uh, it's, it's a tough, tough, tough road. Um, I hope I answered your question. I'm not sure if I did. But, okay, great. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so my question was, after Duke, you went to USC, and I was just curious, what was that experience like, and how were those years? It was very different. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, USC is a city school. It was a whole different environment. And um, coming from Duke, I, I, it was kind of, I had come from a very smaller, tightly, uh, tight uh, community, you know, and USC was this big city school and, and I was not particularly adept at first to uh, dealing with that environment. And uh, I had to kind of uh, adapt to it and learn. And, uh, you know, it was a less friendly kind of environment than Duke had been for me and um, uh, a tougher place, but in many ways that was good. You know, I, I'd kind of come out of the protective environment of Duke and, and uh, went to a place where it was a little more sink or swim in a lot of ways. And, and uh, you know, you had, I had to learn to adapt to that very much. And, and most of the kids, I went there to grad school and a lot of the kids had done undergrad film programs. So they had a leg up on me you know, they'd gone to NYU and undergrads and other schools like that. Back then there was really only, you know, uh, I hate to say it, but it seemed like there were three major film programs. It was NYU, Duke, and I mean, NYU, UC, USC, and UCLA. But now of course that's expanded. There's tons of great film programs across America and you can go to many schools and get a great education in film. But so a lot of those kids came in and they were, you know, a little tougher than I was and a little more experienced. So I, I kind of scrambled my first year there, but then I gradually adapted and, and I, you know, came out doing okay. So it's, it, was, it was tough at first though, definitely. LA being very different. If you've never been to LA, it's a very different place. And I was from the Midwest and then I lived in Durham and, you know, all of a sudden I'm in LA, which was this total crazy place, but I've been here ever since I love it. So, you know, it takes a little while to adjust. Hi, Bob. Uh, hey, hey, Bob. Thank you again for joining us today. Um, when Amy told us that you're originally coming, I started stalking you online, of course. And I saw that you said that when you were at USC, you initially tried directing. 
Yeah. Um, but you found yourself drawn to cinematography. So my question is, what about cinematography drew you in and seems to have never let you go? Well, part of that was, you know, I was very intimidated working with actors. I had never done that before. And uh, they make you take acting classes at USC. And, and uh, you know, I was very kind of shy and withdrawn. And, and uh, I, 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 I didn't understand acting and I didn't know how to deal with the actors. And I, cause I had always been very strongly uh, uh, drawn to the visuals of films, you know, even as a young kid, I, I, I love the spaghetti Westerns. I loved Hitchcock, Kubrick, all those kind of directors that have very striking visual films. And, and uh, cause I had done a lot of still work as well. Um, I just kind of fell into it. And, and what happens in a film school and probably any film school, um, is you when you crew up, you get people who are good at, like some people are natural editors. And uh, so as time went on, I, I kind of got known as a, the camera guy. And so when people would crew up, they'd ask me to shoot their films. And I studied a lot of the cinematography and it just seemed something I was more naturally drawn to. And in the end, I guess I had a talent for it because that's kind of the road I chose to take. But you know, uh, certainly a lot of cinematographers as they go on in their careers, uh, a common stepping stone is when you work in television, uh, the cinematographers there every day, whereas they bring in different directors in every week. And so after a while, the cinematographer knows all the actors, he knows all, how the show should be shot. And many cinematographers then use that as a stepping stone to go on to direct television for sure. And, you know, some even go on to features, but it's a different mindset, I think. So um, I just more comfortable and many people will say, and I, I agree in many ways, I have the best job on the set, you know, uh, and many directors have said that to me. And, you know, it's a very pure job. You, you don't have to deal with a lot of the politics and a lot of the BS that all the other departments have to go through. And my job is, is, is very pure, you know, and, and, and I'm very comfortable with it and, and I enjoy it. So I, I, I don't feel any need to really go rock the boat, so. Yeah, okay. So um, do you think you'll ever use that stepping stone if you haven't already to go into directing? I mean, it seems like you really like cinematography, but. Maybe um, commercial or something. Maybe down the line, but you know, I'm very happy with what I do, and I, I'm lucky that I've been fortunate to hook up with some really great directors, and you know, uh, uh, I, I really enjoy my job, and and uh, I'm not out to pursue it. I know some cinematographers are, and many do move on to direct, but. Um, I'm very comfortable and, and uh, quite honestly, the director has a lot more headaches than I do. And uh, I, I, I uh, you know, I, I can go home and go to bed without a hundred phone calls and complaints and studios calling me. And, you know, I, I, I I'm, I'm very comfortable with where I'm at. So it's not something I really seek and, and particularly in commercials, I just got back from a month long commercial and, and, you know, I shoot a lot of commercials and, um, you know, it's gotten to the point where the directors are really kind of tortured a lot of times by agencies and things. And I don't have to deal with any of that stuff, you know, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a much, I, I'm a person who doesn't like a lot of confrontations <laughs> and uh, directors, their lives are confrontations confrontations with studio people, confrontations with producers, confrontations with actors, you know, and, and uh, I, I prefer just to keep a smooth road and do my thing and, and no one seems to bother me too much. So I'm, I'm very happy where I'm at. Hey there. Um, my question is, what advice would you give your 20 year old self about your career? Um, I would tell, do I have to go back to the to the seventies or twenty year olds today? Because it's a different world. Either, either, either. Well, I would rather talk about kids today uh, because I think there's, as I mentioned earlier, with the digital world, there's a lot more opportunities for you. And people say, "Well, how do I practice cinematography?" 
I say, get your camera out and just go shoot it. Even if it's your iPhone, you know, it doesn't matter, you know. Like my daughter uh, a few years ago wanted to make a little film and uh, we were shooting in LA and um, we were writing, we, believe it or not, we do have a, a, a train here. <laughs> So the, the gist of it was my son gets lost on the train and he goes downtown and he gets lost downtown. And, you know, and, and, you know, I knew that if we brought a camera and a tripod, we attract a lot of attention. I said, why don't you just shoot it on your iPhone? And so we were riding the train, shooting on the iPhone. No one even said anything. We were downtown at, uh, you know, the, the station down there, this beautiful station in downtown LA. And, we were walking around shooting stuff with him and no one ever once came up and said, what are you guys doing? Because she just had her phone. And it, all you say is, oh, I'm just taking a picture of my brother. I mean, no, if that had happened. And, and you know, it's, it's, it gives you the opportunity. She edited it on her computer and, you know, it turned out really well, you know. And, and uh, so I would advise people, just get your camera on and start shooting stuff. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, take a shot of cars driving down the street, you know, just something and start editing it together and, I think that editing, because when I when I got out of school at USC, I, I get a job in the editing room and you really learn how to shoot in the editing room because that's, in the end, that's where the movie's made in the editing room. I mean, it's made on the set as well, of course, but, um, and, and if you know how to shoot for the editing room, I think you'd become a much better cinematographer for sure. So that's, you know, just get your camera and start shooting stuff. Get your friends. It doesn't matter if they're actors or not, you know, it just... And, and, and learn and, and, you know, watch a lot of old movies, which is something I've always done. And during COVID, I, I was pretty much glued to the Turner Classic movies and watching all those movies that I, I hadn't seen. And, uh, you know, I discovered a lot of really great films that I didn't even know existed. So, you know, it's, it's important. Hi, Bob, thanks for coming. Um, so I guess my question is, is about like kind of the cost of everything. Like grad school obviously is one thing. And then if you wanna do cinematography or any sort of independent work, you end up having to rent stuff or buy stuff for yourself. Um, what was my question? My question is how do we hone our skills and get noticed and also like make sure that we're not living in squalor, I guess. Like how did you do it? How did you? Um, can I get those opportunities? Well, when I started, as I said, uh, it was all film. It was no digital, didn't, digital cameras didn't even exist. And so, um, you know, it was very difficult. It was very frustrating because when you start, you never get hired for anything. And, and uh, so you just sit in your apartment waiting for the phone to ring. And we didn't even have answering machines. <laughs> so you couldn't go out because if you missed the phone call, you were screwed. So you just kind of had to sit home and hope the phone rang. And, uh, and, and you know, gradually I, I worked in, as I said, I worked in an editing room eventually. And then I just begged the people to let me go out and shoot stuff. And gradually they let me do it. And we made some really bad commercials, but I learned a lot. Um, but in today's world, I think you need to just get out and make stuff. And, and you know, I, I just got off the phone with my daughter not too long ago. And, and um, you know, I said, you've got to, she shot some student films. And I said, you got to put something together to show people because if, if you want to work, the first thing they're going to say, you know, and, and no diss on Duke or any school, but they don't say, where'd you go to school? You know, they don't care in the film industry. They say, okay, you want to shoot something? Let's see what you've done, you know, and, and you have to have a reel of, of something that you shot. So, you know, and, and, you know, we would do things. There's a thing the ASC has uh, it's called Shot Deck. And, you know, I would recommend you kind of look at it because they take... Uh, uh, a shot from a movie and they talk about how it was done and during COVID uh, just you know my, my house my daughter was here my wife and my son and she would get stills from movies and and we would just recreate them at our house and we'd shoot them on the black magic camera you know and you could do it on a camera you could do it on an iphone but you know, and she would, uh, we have a couple little lights here and, and she, just working with that and with the digital cameras, the beauty is you don't need a lot of lights. You know, it, it, you can do things with very minimal lights. It doesn't even have to be movie lights, you know, and uh, you could take a lamp and put it here and light me that with the lamp, you know, and, and just learn your craft. And, and uh, 
learn what you like, you know, bounce the light, you know, try different things, you know, take a bounce card and put a light up and bounce into it from the side and then put it behind the camera and bounce it that way and put it down low and bounce that way and, and learn lighting and, and then gradually start shooting things. And, uh, you know, eventually, you know, you could put a little reel together and then, you know, it's, it's so hard to break in. You know, I thought, you know, like when I was at USC, we, my last year there, we shot a, I shot a film that won a student academy award. And, and I thought, oh, well, this is going to be easy. I'm going to go out and get a job right away. Well, no, I didn't. I worked as a PA, you know, and uh, the only reason I got the job as a PA was the director uh, was a basketball freak. And I was at a commercial house and Joe Pitka, who went on to become probably the greatest commercial director ever. And he liked to go out and shoot hoops on his downtime. So they hired me to go play basketball with Joe. So my, uh, my freshman year, as Amy said, I was a walk on on the team. And so I could play basketball. <laughs> so that's what got me the job was I could go out and shoot hoops with Joe. And, um, you know, but that, you know, however you get your foot in the door, you got to get your foot in the door somehow. And, and uh, but if you have something to show, that's, that's really important you know, really important and, and just shoot as much as you can. And if you can edit as much as you can. And, and I think in today's world, things are a lot easier with digital cameras and digital editing systems, etc. Hi, Bob, well, thanks for coming in. Um, my question is just, what are a few unexpected challenges of working on set and in the film industry? Huh. Unexpected challenge. Well, every day is unexpected. I'll tell you that. <laughs> you know, there's always uh, something that comes on, and and uh, you know, everybody, including the cinematographer, gets thrown curveballs all the time. I mean, you're out there shooting, and and uh, it's a sunny day. Like okay, Florida, for instance. You know, you go down to Florida, and it's sunny for a few hours, and then it's raining, and then it's sunny, and then it's raining. And how do you match that footage? It's difficult which is one of the reasons they moved the movie industry to California, you know, because it's pretty much sunny here all the time. But, um, you know, you're constantly, you have to be willing to roll with the punches, definitely. And a lot of times things change. Um, you know, you, you have a shot list that you work up with the director before you shoot. And then the actors show up and they rehearse and it changes the blocking, it changes everything. and and. Uh, so you have to be pretty quick on your feet to to make the changes and 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 you know many times I work with directors who uh, we've kind of worked out how we're going to shoot a scene and then when the actors get there everything changes dramatically so you can't your game plan is just thrown out the window and um, some directors like Wes Anderson for instance are very you know controlled they're very much about the image other directors I work with. Are, are more about the writing and the acting and they you know you know they'll say okay what do you want to do and they'll look at me and I, I have to come up with the plan you know and, and you have to be really quick on your feet which I think is another reason why having worked in the editing room and understanding editing helps because I know kind of what you need to make this work and and uh so I can make my suggestions and most of the time they'll say yeah that sounds great or they might say uh, maybe I want this a little more or whatever. It's it's a kind of a little bit of negotiation that goes on, but you know you really have to think quickly on your feet and and adapt to the conditions, particularly when you're not in a studio when you're outside because you can't control what happens. And uh, you know it might you might have planned everything for a nice sunny day and it's pouring rain, so all of a sudden you have to change the plan. So. It's, it's, it's a constant, it's a constant change. It's very rarely that things work out exactly how you expect it will. Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is, so you kind of already actually answered half the question about staying flexible on set, but like, what is your process for preparing um, in terms of cinematography? Uh, like you know, the storyboarding shot list, um, and is there like a difference when you're uh, planning a drama versus a comedy? Yeah, uh, well, th that the proper the prep props uh, the prep process 
uh, is very uh, different for every movie, really. Uh, typically, uh, you know, I come in and what they call prep, you know, and it can be a month, it could be six weeks, could be eight weeks. And I go to every location with the director and the production designer, and we just get the script out and we break it down. What do we like about this location? And we even try to block, do a rough blocking of, of uh, what's going to happen. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about Wes for a minute. We, we, we actually bring a film camera, we shoot film on his films, and, and uh, we often, either with just the available light, we will shoot shots just uh, for something for him to look at and kind of digest. And uh, so then he takes, after that, he'll go back and he has, uh, they make an animatic, which is like a little cartoon, you know, and he will take the ideas that we come up with and he will, uh, uh, you know, have his, uh, the guy who makes the animatic, make a little animatic. And then, then we all look at the animatic and we break it down. And, um, you know, we, but we always know, have a very clear idea with him when we get to the set, what we're going to shoot. And, and uh, we rarely uh, deviate from that. It's always pretty carefully planned out because everything in his movies, if you're familiar with his films, they're, they're very uh, uh, carefully controlled. The backgrounds, the art direction, the co everything is just so carefully controlled. We do a lot of testing with colors, uh, you know, like on the Grand Budapest Hotel, we, 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 we painted flats, different colors, and, and put the wardrobe on people who were not the actors, they weren't there. And we would shoot tests with that to see how the wardrobe would look against the backgrounds. And uh, then we make certain uh, alterations in the colors and things. And, and uh, you know, we're, everything is so well planned so that when the movie is actually being shot, it's, it's all been worked out beforehand, except for the actors, of course. And, and Wes is pretty good about you know, convincing the actors to do what he wants them to do. And they're all pretty good about it. You know, there's no real discussion about, no, I really wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be standing by the window. Those discussions don't really go on. Um, whereas when I work with Paul Fig, for instance, on movies like Bridesmaids, you know, it's, it's a, and Wes is, there's always one camera. It's always very ter carefully controlled one camera. But on some of the comedies, um, you know, it's a lot looser because so much of it is improv and we shoot two, sometimes three cameras. And, um, you know, the actors get there, they do a rough blocking, they're free to go where they want. Paul certainly uh, encourages improvisation, encourages them to do what they need to do, want to do. And so it's a much looser style. And so, um, a lot of it's kind of more on the fly, you know, we get there and they, we see what's going to happen. And so then we, you know, uh, uh, while we're there, we kind of make a plan and try to stick to it. But again, we have to be so open to improvisation, which is part of the reason why we shoot multiple cameras is like if you and I are having a conversation, if they have a camera on me and a camera on you and uh you know, uh, if something happens really funny, you know, th that's that's their dream. And, and that way they have it already captured rather than have to go back and recreate it. Because when you try to recreate something, it never quite matches what, you know, you lose the spark on the recreation a lot of times. And comedy, for him, the comedy is the most important thing. You know, he, he cares about how his movies look, but it's obviously not a Wes Anderson film where it's it's so so controlled and you know uh, everything is just so precise. Whereas it's a lot looser situation. So um, comedies, there's you know people say well comedies should be brighter. Uh, you know probably that's a little there's a little truth in that. You know uh, you know uh, you, you, it's rare that you see really dark comedies but um, dark cinematography wise. And, uh, but that said, I think Gordon Willis and Woody Allen kind of broke a lot of rules and, and, and back in the day and, and they made them look more natural looking. They weren't just very brightly lit 
comedies. They were, you know, movies that felt natural, but they weren't too dark, you know? And, and that's always been kind of my thing with the movies is make them look like it's a real place and a real, you know, real situation. And, you know, people are a little down or whatever, but I would never go, you know, overboard. You know, I just watched Mank, for instance, and it's, it's, it's a very dark movie. And, and, you know, um, you know, I don't think that would fly in a comedy. You know, I, I think, you know, people want to see people's faces a little better than that. But that, you know, that was the style that they chose on that particular film. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so you mentioned that you actually started out as a, like a still photographer. So I was wondering if there still is a space for still photography in the industry of like filmmaking in cinematography and if so how I can find opportunities as a still photographer uh yeah well every set has a still photographer by the way and uh you know in my particular case uh you know because I'm in the union they, you have to get into the still photographers union I'm not sure how you do that but they are on the set and their job is to uh take behind the scenes shots of the cast and crew and director, whatever. And they also uh, shoot uh, shots of, uh, while we're shooting many times that they use for promotion. And uh, so we always have a still photographer on the set, you know, and, um, and they also do things like sometimes they, for the poster, you know, they, they take the actors off to the side, they might have a seamless or whatever or they do it on the set. Many times they'll uh, want to do it on the set. So we, we lit the set and then we leave and let them have the set for a little while so they can, they can shoot. So uh, usually it's only one still photographer. Um, but and again, I don't know how you get into that, but you, know, you might look at the still photographers union and see what their requirements are. Uh, but they're an important part and they're actually kind of part of our camera team and, and uh, that would be one, one thing that I think you could certainly look at, you know, is that, and I just did a, this uh, month long commercial and, and they had a still team with us the whole time. We were traveling around the U S and uh, you know, we would shoot the commercial at a certain location. And then again, we would leave and the still guys would come in and they would, uh, they would have it for an hour or whatever they needed. And, and they would shoot stills because the, when you're making a commercial, they also want to do print ads as well. And so they need the stills. So that's another way of looking into it, you know, is, is I, you know, these people are kind of more known, you know, they're more known, not in the film industry, but they're more still people who uh, have gotten into commercial photography. So that's still a viable thing. And, and uh, you know, as I said, we travel all around and the, the still team, there's five of them, you know, the guy had four assistants. And uh, they traveled with us, so uh, and and they shot a lot of stills that they'll use for, you know, advertising their products. Hi, uh, thanks again for being here. Um, you already talked a little bit about working with uh, Wes Anderson and Paul Feig. How was it uh, to work with Noah Baumbach, and how did like your artistic ideas? Uh, kind of like differ with those directors and how was that like collaborative process? Uh, well, Noah was friends with Wes. They had been co-writing and I knew him, you know, very minimally through Wes. And Wes actually was a producer on Squid and the Whale. And uh, so when Noah got put the movie together, uh, they Wes said, hey, you know, would you do this movie? And, I, and you know, I, I said, sure. I like the script a lot. And, uh, you know, Noah had a concept partially because creative and partially due to budget because the movie was made for $1.5 million. And we shot it in like 23 days, which is nothing in New York City. And uh, he want, he was a big fan of the French New Wave and, and he wanted a very mobile camera. And, and so we shot it in 60 millimeter, which was, I won't say it was unusual, but most movies were being shot at 35 millimeter at that time. And it just gave us a chance to uh, be much freer with the camera. Most of it was handheld, I handheld the movie. 
And he also wanted the actors to feel free, uh, you know, to move where they wanted. He didn't want to put marks on the floor. So if the actors moved around, I, I was free to kind of move around to keep them all in the frame or to try to get as good compositions as I could. Uh, what it meant for me was more general type lighting, um, whereas, you know, sometimes movies are very specifically lit for certain things. Uh, this meant more just generally lighting a room so the actors could move around and do what they want. And, and uh, I remember at the end of the film, Jeff Daniels came up to me and said, uh, uh, this is the most free I've ever felt in any movie. You know, he was being very nice. But, uh, you know, Noah was really, as a writer, he was really concerned with the writing and the performance of the actors. And uh, obviously he had opinions on shots and we talked it through, but I had a lot of freedom to kind of do what I wanted. And uh, he was generous enough at the beginning of the film to say, you know, because we we're shooting in, in Park Slope, Brooklyn. And I said, you know, the street looks great in the afternoon. In the morning, it's all front lit. It's not so good. And he said, listen, I just need to make my days. And, and if you need to shoot the street in the afternoon, we can shoot inside in the morning, you know. And he was very good about that. And um, so I think he only lost one scene because of time. And, and we were on a very tight schedule. So he kind of gave me a lot of freedom to do what I needed to do within the confines of what I just discussed. It was handheld and general lighting and, you know, uh, but knowing that, you know, I embraced that as a, as a concept and, and uh, you know, it, it, it was a great experience. I think we all had fun working on the movie and to be honest with you, it turned out even way better than I thought it would, <laughs> you know, I mean, so, and a lot of it has to do with Noah and the actors, of course, but, uh, you know, um, it, you know, it came out even better, you know, I thought it'd be a good movie, but it's funny because certain movies I work on, I think will be great and they don't turn out so great. And other movies, uh, you know, you think, oh, that'll be pretty good. And they like Bridesmaids is a perfect example. I, I had no idea when we were making that film, uh, you know, they would turn into such a phenomenon and, uh, you know, um, so and all of a sudden it became this huge hit and I was like, wow, I mean, I, I didn't expect that. So, you know, you never quite know in anything, I guess, but Squid and the Whale was a great experience and, and it was kind of modeled on the French new wave, I guess, <laughs> so. Hi, um, I'm Marlo. Thank you for speaking with us today. Um, I had a few questions, but I feel like you've pretty thoroughly covered most of them. So I'm going to just narrow it down um, and ask kind of about the evolution of your influence on films and projects and how you feel like that's gone from when you started out in the film industry to now and like how you've evolved as a part of projects and the influence you've had as, as they are in development. I don't know if that made sense. Well, when I started out, I would take any job I was offered. <laughs> And I think most people are that way. And uh, so I, I think anybody who's been in the business as long as I have, uh, no matter whether you're a cinematographer, director, or actor, or whatever, you'll have a few stinkers on your reel, you know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's just part of the deal. But so I've become a lot more selective as I've gotten older. And uh, as you get more experience, you get offered a lot more, you know, I get offered a fair amount of movies and, and uh, I just, you know, you hate to turn things down, but I just say, and sometimes it's difficult because you haven't worked for a while, but you know, you're kind of judged by what you've been working on and it's easy to be pigeonholed. And many cinematographers, uh, for instance, you know, you get into these big comedies like I've done, and then all of a sudden all you get is the comedy scripts and, and you want to be able to do other things as well. So what I've done is I've been very careful if I've done one or two big studio comedies in a row, I, I, I purposely make my next movie a, a more personal dram dramatic type film or, you know, I, I did a movie, Love and Mercy. I don't know if you know, it was a, about Brian Wilson. And, um, that was great. and, and just, uh, just kind of, uh, you know, try to bounce back and forth because otherwise all after a very short time you you get pigeon it's like an actor really 
and an actor does, you know, uh, some comedies and all of a sudden that's all he never gets a dramatic part anymore and, and then all of a sudden you see some actor you know doing a dramatic film you know I mean Jim Carrey or Adam Sandler and you're like well wait a minute you know that's that's you know but, but then you see them in a dramatic film and they're really good and, and so it's important to mix it up I think um, the one thing I've learned in terms of my approach and, and, and it goes back to Gordon Willis again, a famous cinematographer. And he said, you know, simplify. And it's more about taking things away than putting things in, you know. And, and particularly with digital cameras, I learned, you know, oftentimes it's generally the first thing I do is I go in a room, I turn off all the lights, you know, and just see what's there. And, and like I was just on this commercial and we were in a, a a gymnasium and then we were in a, a pool situation and the, the, they had all these really ugly lights that were casting all these shadows and so I said just turn all the lights off you know and it, immediately it just looked way better you know there was just this giant window at the end and it let this light in and we just filled it in a little bit and and with digital cameras you you, you can do that you know with film maybe you couldn't you know um and they're so sensitive, these cameras. And, and uh, you know, so that's what I say, you're shooting something and there's a window in your room, just turn all the other lights off for starters and see what's there, you know? And then maybe you have to add one or two little lights and you're fine, but it'll probably look uh, uh, really beautiful, you know? And, and uh, so simplify things and don't overcomplicate it, you know? Some people get so hook, hooked on technology and they, you know, like many cinematographers, I, I'm in the ASC, which is American Society of Cinematographers. And, and you know, you go to these meetings and, you know, uh, sometimes these people are so hung up on all the latest gadgets and the latest gear. And I, I, you know, I'm like, you know, I have no interest in that, you know, it's, it's, yeah, okay, I try to keep up on it, but and if something can help me, I'll use it. You know, LED lights, for instance. You know, you can get LED lights now, and I bought a couple for our my daughter and our home use here. And you know, uh, they take less power. You can control the lights. It's so much better. And and, but I'm not hung up on that stuff. You know, it, it's it, it's meaningful but meaningless at the same time. You know, what what are you trying to achieve? And what what emotion? are you looking for to visually convey what the scene is, is all about? And, and that's, you, you should look at your script and look at the, what, what you're trying to say and discuss with the director, you know, what if we try this, you know, and, and uh, you know, get his input or his or her input. And, and uh, you know, uh, many times directors don't even ask how I'm gonna light it, I just do it, you know, and, they come and say, are you ready? I say, yeah, <laughs> you know, so, but you have to react and put yourself, you could take 10 cinematographers and you bring them into a room and, and you know, you have the actors rehearse the scene and then you say, okay, how are you gonna shoot this and how are you gonna light it? And I could almost guarantee you'd come up with 10 different ways. You know, everyone brings their own perspective, their own experience, their own being into how they make those decisions. And, and uh, you know, that's what distinguishes Roger Deakins from, you know, Joe Blow down at the news station, you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you know, and, and when we started digital cameras, I remember an editor saying to me, you know, uh, well, I guess that's the end of cinematography, because anybody can do it now. And I just looked at him and said, okay, you give Roger Deakins a camera and one light, and you give somebody on the street a camera and one light and have him shoot the same thing. And let's see what happens, you know, because it doesn't matter. The technology is only a tool that we should use. It's not something that should control how we think. So that's kind of my, my feelings. Hi, Bob. So again, thank you for joining us today. Um, but the question I had was, so you've worked in a lot of different projects, different genres, and I'm sure that filming on set can be quite a time consuming and demanding task. <laughs> but so my question was more along the lines of how do you recharge creatively? Do you have like passion projects on the side to kind of refuel your energy or passion? Or are there other things that you like to do between jobs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to take time off. I, I remember one time years ago, I did uh, three movies in a row. And by the third one, I was just so burned out. Uh, you know, it was a mistake. And I've learned to take downtime. Um, 
I, I try to watch films and um, I'm a sports junkie. I, you know, I watch Duke basketball. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, what happened is really sad. Our team was just starting to gel, I think. And uh, I'm a big fan of our freshmen. I think uh, not to be a sideline here, but, uh, you know, I think Williams really proved himself at the end there. I love Stewart and Roach. You know, I think that if all those guys come back, we're going to have a great team next year. But, um, you know, that said, my son is a, a, a soccer player and I, I never really followed soccer. I, I go to all his games and, um, you know, you have to have other interests and, you know, uh, you kind of, and, and most of my friends uh, here in, at home uh, are not in the film business. And, and so we just go and talk about sports, politics, all kinds of things. And, um, you know, it's important not just to get tunnel vision, I think, you know, and, and expand yourself, go to museums. Uh, again, I love photo shows. Uh, I take a lot of photos when I'm not working, uh, you know, and, and I love still photography, I always have. And, you know, uh, you know, it's something that I just enjoy doing and have a hobby. I ride my bike on the beach, you know, and it's just get yourself out and uh, expose yourself to a lot of things that you might not ordinarily expose yourself to. And, and uh, sports has always been a big part of my life. So that's one thing that I like to do. So, you know, but go, to Bob, museums. Oh, go to museums for sure. Okay, go ahead. Sorry for interrupting. No. Hi Bob, thanks again for coming. I'm Andrew. And I was curious to ask you, although you've talked a lot about like individual projects you've worked on already, what is your favorite project that you have worked on and why? Huh. Well, it's always, I always get asked that question. It's always difficult. And uh, I guess uh, if I were to choose one, I mean, it, each one is unique and, and each one is a life adventure. And particularly when you travel, uh, you know, like uh, which I do with Wes, uh, every movie is very unique. And like we went to India and that, I mean, you know, you know, how can you put a, a figure on that? I mean, you, you know, you, you experience, and, and the, one of the things I like most about it is that I, I typically work with the local crews. And so I immerse myself in their worlds and uh, it really teaches you a lot about other cultures. And um, I think a lot of Americans tend not to travel through the world. I've been to, you know, China, Asia, all through Europe. I've been to Africa, India, everywhere, you know, South America. And you really get a world perspective on that. And uh, I think that's really valuable. And, and you kind of see the, see the world differently than I think a lot of Americans do. Um, you know, if I had to choose one, uh, I would probably say the Grand Budapest Hotel because, um, we were in this beautiful little town in Germany, Eastern Germany on the Polish border and uh, in the winter. And we had a really special crew, a really special cast. And, uh, you know, I think also the fact that film turned out in my opinion very well, uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, shades my decision a little bit. But, you know, I, any of Wes's movies, I, we just did uh, one that's been sitting in the can, The French Dispatch, and we were in a little city in, called Angoulême, France. And, you know, on the weekends, uh, we would all head to these little French bars and everyone would meet up and have drinks. And, you know, it was just the sense of camaraderie you get with crews uh, is really special and something I wouldn't trade. And again, having worked with crews from all over the world, um, you really kind of uh, get insights into their lives and you learn a lot about people and, and that, you know, you really learn that we're all just, you know, one big happy or unhappy family as the case may be. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I just, the traveling and experiences I've had with traveling has been incredibly valuable for me. I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Hi, Bob. I think I get the last question. Okay. Um, I'm not a Studio Duke student. Actually, I graduated last year um, and I studied film at Duke. Yeah. And everyone's been such a consummate professional speaking with you. But I had to say that you are one of the reasons I came to Duke. Oh, that's nice. I keep this 
on my coffee. Uh, okay. There are some great photos of you in here. So yes. Um, but I just wanted to maybe finish with the fun question. Well, they've all been fun questions, but I just want to know a movie that you've watched recently that you really liked and that really stood out to you and why. Uh I liked a couple of movies. Well, you know, I've been watching a lot of the screeners and uh, uh, I liked Minari. I liked Nomadland. I liked uh, One Night in Miami. And I'm stumbling because I can't remember, but I, it was the one about the Black Messiah, the guy who goes behind with the Black Panthers. I really liked that movie. And uh, I liked uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. That was a really good one. Uh, so these are recent movies that I really liked a lot. Um, you know, I, I think that the most interesting films today in America, uh, you know, are, are the, the smaller budget films, you know, too, too much. I'm not, you know, I, I shouldn't say this, but I will. I'm not a big Marvel fan. I'm not the big studio movie fan. You know, I think those movies become more about, you know, merchandising and things like that, where the smaller personal films uh, I think are to me the most interesting ones, you know, and, and uh, so that, those are the films I tend to really like and, and I'm really happy to see, particularly this year, and, and I voted, you know, for the first round of the Oscars, but um, we have another round to come up, but, you know, to see those films get recognized and, and uh, I hope that, you know, as the younger people come along, that they embrace those films as well. and you know, uh, as younger people start making these films and we're seeing filmmakers, women, people of color, people from Korea, you know, who are getting attention, which I think is just awesome and great. You know, I'm all for it. And it really, it, it you know, it, it gets us out of a rut that I think we've been in for a while now. And, and I, I'm really supportive of all that. So, you know, any of those movies in the, God, I can't remember the name, the one about the Black Messiah guy. Yeah, Judas, Judas and the Black Messiah. Yeah, it's such a great movie. And uh, Daniel Kaluuya is so fantastic. And, you know, I'm just so, you know, uh, excited when you see that kind of thing. And, um, you know, uh, it, it, what's interesting too, it, in that particular film, what struck home to me was, you know, that was in the 60s when, when I was in Chicago and, uh, you know, I grew up in a white suburb and, and the Black Panthers were always kind of, you know, looked upon in the white suburbs as, you know, you know stay away from them, they're trouble. And then you see it from their perspective and, you know, you, it kind of opens your eyes, you know, a little bit to what was really going on. And, and so it really struck a strong personal chord with me when I watched that film and just, you know, uh, uh, you know, anyway, I, I, I like the smaller films uh, generally, you know, very rarely do I see a big blockbuster that I go, wow, that's a great film, you know, it's more of the smaller films. Minari was another one. I thought Minari, and, and I, and at the ASC, I've sponsored that. I have to, you know, you, you know, have to make a speech about Minari, but, you know, um, you know, it's just kind of really, is, there was a truth to it, and, and Nomadland the same way. There was a real strong truth to those films, and, and, I know Frances McDormand, I've done several movies with her. She's such a sweetheart and a great actress. And, you know, it's just so, uh, you know, wonderful to see those types of films get that recognition. So. Yeah, hear, hear, Bob. Those are incredible films. Um, speaking of, you're headed to a, a commercial scout. What are you up to? Well, uh, we're doing this thing. It's a credit thing. Um, and what happened is there, uh, uh, we have to choose a location, and uh, that, that's what came up today. And and they're building a set upside down and a set right side up. And we were on a Zoom earlier today, and and they were trying have to choose the location because they have to buy off on it. And they said, "Could you possibly meet today?" And and I said, "Yeah, not until after three thirty. But so I'm, I'm gonna hop in the car and go over there now and look at the location because I have to say, "Yeah, we could make this work," you know. So. That's kind of what I'm doing. And then uh, this summer, uh, unfortunately with COVID, uh, you know, uh, all the movies were pushed and then all of a sudden they're all happening at once. 
but I chose, uh, the, I had several offers and I chose, uh, I'm going to go back with Wes. We're going to make a movie in Spain. So I'll be going to Spain this summer. So, you know. Wow. Amazing. The day of the life of Bob Yeoman. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Pretty it's incredible. Good. You deserve it. Might not be as exciting as the life of Amy, but you know, uh, <laughs> you know, well, it's what it is. Well, we're pretty lucky to have you with us today. Uh, round of applause for Bobby Oman.